Thank you, worship leaders. I just want to say I, I appreciate, appreciate all the countries giving. I have a special place in my heart uh, for the Filipino people. And uh, I thought the one thing that the U.S. government did that was right was send not the Army, not the Air Force, not the Navy, but the United States Marine Corps. Very smart move. Why? Yeah. <laughs> Although I don't look like it, I'm a former Marine. Never say ex-Marine, by the way. Bad word. Yeah. Former Marine. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, I'm Kevin, one of the pastors, in case I haven't met you. Uh, I get to come and worship on occasion. I have a different ministry uh, over the hill over there in another part of town. And it's always good to be here. Just one more thing that in Chris's report, I, I just don't know how a, a Swedish furniture company can give more than the whole nation of China, but I'm glad what China gives and uh, God can use it. That's wonderful. Um, let's pray for God's word today and how it will affect our hearts and lives. Uh, Father in heaven, we ask that you would bless your word to our hearts today, Lord. Open up our ears, our hearts, our minds to receive your word. Father, impact us today with your word. Change us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, I'm so glad to be here. And uh, I just, you know, it, it caused me to imagine why some people would want to skip church when you can be here with God's people and worship and get fed and get revived and serve others. Uh, some of you don't even know how you serve others as you just walk around and shake a hand, put your hand on someone's shoulder. You don't realize what a ministry you have in just that one small thing. And if you stay home, you're not doing that, right? Okay, that would be another sermon. Nehemiah. I've been working through Nehemiah for uh, about a year or so, and uh, it's my favorite Old Testament book. And today we're going to continue in Nehemiah, and the subtitle is Opposition. And uh, we need to talk about and understand opposition in the life of the believer. We're going to look at Nehemiah 4 and Nehemiah 2, and we're going to go over to Matthew, and we might look at a, another scripture too, but just bear with me as we have a lot of slides and uh, um, quite a few scriptures to look at, but not a whole lot. Well, Nehemiah, Nehemiah was living in modern-day Iran when God laid something in his heart, and it was to go to his uh, ancestral country of Israel where Jerusalem was. He had never been there. Probably his grandparents had come over there in an exile. So just some history. Uh, the city of Jerusalem has always faced opposition. In 444 BC, Nehemiah, our hero today, comes on the scene, and this is what happens. He's working in Iran, or Persia at that time, for the king. He's a, a member of the king's court. He serves the king. He serves the king's wife and family. He goes into their home and has meals with them. And probably uh, Nehemiah is a eunuch. And Otherwise, he wouldn't have been allowed on the king's court. It's probably just one fact. And he's in comfortable surroundings. He's got a lifetime job. 
wonderful job serving the king and his family. He's right there. He's probably uh, an interpreter for the king. He hangs out with dignitaries. And some of the king's people come back. And one of those persons that come back from visiting Jerusalem is Nehemiah's cousin. And when Nehemiah says, hey, great, you guys are back. Tell me all about Jerusalem. And they said, it's terrible. The gates are burned. The walls are broken down. The people are discouraged. It's just overrun. It's awful. At that point, Nehemiah gets a great burden, a disturbance in his soul. He can't settle down. He can't tolerate the city of God being broken and in ruin. And he goes to prayer. And he begins to fast. And he does this for four and a half months. This thing won't leave him. And one day he's serving the king, and the king notices that he's not too cheerful of late. And he says, Nehemiah, what's bothering you? Come on, you can tell me. Cheer up. And he said, how can I cheer up when the city of my ancestors, the city of God, the tombs of my people lie in ruins, burned? How can I cheer up? He risks having his head lopped off. You can't be without cheer in the presence of the king. We talked about a couple of sermons ago. So the king says, well, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, I want to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And the king says, well, when are you going to come back? And, you know, this is 1,600 kilometers away. And it's, there are no buses, there are no uh, high-speed trains, no aircraft, no boats. It's 1,600 kilometers one way. He's going to go back and rebuild. We find out later, in, as we read Nehemiah, that he comes back 12 years later. So it doesn't benefit the king at all to send Nehemiah away, but he does anyway. Somehow God stirs the heart of the king and sends Nehemiah there with money and equipment and food and a military uh, unit to support him. A whole unit. So that's where we are. 444, you know, Nehemiah comes on the scene. And then before that, Nebuchadnezzar attacked and besieged Judah and Jerusalem. It's a long time before Nehemiah. Well, this is, could be when, when uh, Nehemiah's relatives came over in the uh, exile with Daniel and his friends. What were Daniel's friends' names? Shadrach and Abednego, yes. And they, they all came over and could be in that part with uh, you know, Daniel's grandparents. Uh, I'm sorry, Nehemiah's grandparents. So that was the history when, you know, long before Nehemiah... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, the whole uh, nation of Judah, actually. And even before that, in 538 B.C., just some history. History's boring, I know. But Zerubbabel was sent to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Just the temple, not the whole city, not the walls. And while he was there, opposition from the locals came. They really, really, really didn't want to see the temple in Jerusalem rebuilt. Because what do the Jews do when they start worshiping God and everything? They kind of take over the, the area. And their God works for them and serves them. And the people around them become subservient to them. And that had happened since way back when, and they didn't want to see this again. So even way back when, when Zerubbabel went, you, you think it's easy to pronounce? You try saying it ten times in a row. Zerubbabel, okay? When he went back, opposition was there. And even today, we know today, how often is Jerusalem and Israel and the Mideast in the news? Daily. It's always in the news. Jerusalem will always face opposition. The Jews and Jerusalem as well. Okay. So, what about this opposition to Nehemiah's work? Well, Nehemiah was coming to reestablish Jerusalem's boundaries. That was not a good thing for the people living in that area that had been there for years and years. 
They were comfortable in that area, but he came in to do that. We're going to read about that too. I just want to give you a little background first. He was coming back to set up the walls, which were basically boundaries. They were knocked down. They had been burned. The gates were burned. The rocks were burned. I don't know how they burn rocks, but scripture tells us that the rocks were burned. And uh, he was coming back to do that, so the leaders in that area weren't too happy with him. He was coming back to restore worship. And when the Jewish people began to worship God in spirit and in truth, the other nations around them are not comfortable. God begins to work for the people of Israel, the, the Jewish people. He begins to prosper them. And if he's prospering Israel, the other nations are going to become worried. Wait a minute, where's my cut? Where's my piece of the pie? We're comfortable with the way things are here. We don't want this. So Nehemiah is going to become the target of the opposition forces that have been there for years. They're established. They're comfortable. They have a status quo. They don't want Nehemiah coming in to upset what they've established. Everything's good. Everything's fine. Well, don't come in here and rock our boat. We, we are okay here. We don't need you. As I said, the governors of that area had nothing to gain by Jerusalem being restored, by these boundaries being put back in place. So naturally, they're going to oppose the work of Nehemiah. If it would have been beneficial to the local governors of that area to have the walls rebuilt and the boundaries reestablished, they'd have done it themselves long ago. But when the team that came back from Jerusalem to report to Nehemiah in Iran or Persia, and they said, it's awful, it's terrible, there's nothing good, people are so down and depressed. Nehemiah had it in his heart, this, this isn't right, this just can't be. Although he'd never been to Jerusalem, he knew that something had to be done. God wouldn't let his spirit rest. God was dealing with Nehemiah. Now, let's read today's text. You can read it in your bulletin, or you can just follow with me. I'm going to read it from this very old Bible that I bought for my wife many years ago. It felt kind of good to hold a paper Bible again. You know. Maybe I should do that more. When, uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. When Sabalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what, are, what they are building, if even a fox climbed upon it, he would break down their wall of stones. You know, I, I think uh, Tolkien must have got uh, Sauruman and Wormwood from this scene because you know Wormwood is just standing by Sauruman whispering in his ear and Topaya is just standing there and going yeah whatever he said but anyway look at what they said in these ver verses look very carefully at these verses the leaders of the opposition attacked their character have you ever tried to do something worthwhile and somebody attacked your character oh you're so feeble you're so weak who do you think you are they didn't care. They just didn't want them there doing what they were doing. So why not just do a character assassination right here? You feeble Jews, what are you doing? You attacked their motives. Have you ever tried to do something in church or at work and somebody said, I know the real reason you're doing that. Yeah, you, you say you're doing that for God, but I know. When, couldn't that be discouraging? Wouldn't that just break your heart? 
It would make me want to, okay, yeah, pack my bags, take my ball and go home. They attacked their mission. Are you sure you're doing this? Are you rebelling against the king here? I know you got the paperwork and all that. They attacked their God. Have you ever wanted to defend God? Hey, don't say that about God. That's fighting words. It's my God. I'll, I'll give you something for that. You know? God doesn't need our defense, does he? Have you ever had your ability questioned? When you knew God had you doing something. When you knew you were doing the right thing. When you worked hard to get where you were. And somebody said, Man, that work that you're doing, that's going to come undone in no time. You should have known better than let you do that. Break your heart. Discourage you. That's what they were doing. Well, opposition to his work. Nehemiah knew that God sent him. Remember, before he took off, before he even approached the king, Nehemiah prayed and fasted for four and a half months. Maybe it was a partial fast. I'm sure it was. Maybe some days he fasted completely. But he didn't move for four and a half months. And then he approached the king. But they opposed Nehemiah's work, not because it was Nehemiah himself. They didn't care what Nehemiah looked like. They didn't care about the color of his skin. They didn't oppose him because it was a racial thing. They didn't oppose him because he was tall, short, fat, skinny, because he wore nice clothes, Before he did, because he didn't wear nice clothes. It didn't have to be Nehemiah. It could have been anyone else. If someone else would have come to restore and rebuild the city of God, the opposition would have come. They didn't want the city of God restored. They didn't want the walls rebuilt. It didn't matter who it was. It was not personal. It was not about Nehemiah. Keep that in mind. The opposition would have come no matter who would have shown up to rebuild the walls. The local leaders represent the status quo. The way things are. The way things have always been. Everything's good. Everything's fine. We like it like this. We, we don't want it to change. We're, we're doing all right without you, Nehemiah. Or whoever you are. Go back there. They didn't even know Nehemiah. I mean, he just showed up with some papers and that was it. But Nehemiah came to disrupt that big time. His purpose was not to disrupt their status quo. His purpose was to build the walls, to reestablish the city of God. But he would disrupt that, and they knew that, and they were going to oppose him anyway. So how does Nehemiah respond to the opposition? Well, he absorbed the attacks. As we, if you sit down and read this book, you'll find out that Nehemiah never screams at these people. He never attacks first. He just responds, and he absorbs the text. Whenever they say things about him, whenever they do things to him, whenever they plot against him and his workers, he never retaliates in a physical, verbal, abusive way. He just absorbs their attacks. He just listens to them. And when he came there, he didn't pick a fight with the local leaders. Even though he knew, he was well aware that he would face opposition when he arrived. He knew that. He was not blind to what was going to happen. And he didn't go in and first say to, you guys, say to the opposition, I know what you're thinking. Get it out of your minds or I've got the army right here. He didn't do that. He didn't pick a fight at all. They did. They came to him. Now, he had the king's army with him. And he could have said, I know the guys who are going to cause the problem, go in and put them in cuffs and bring them here, and then we'll explain what we're doing. Or go in and wipe them out. Now, the king of Persia at that time was the strongest king in the world. 
He was the king of kings. There was no one stronger. His arm, army ruled the world. And Nehemiah had a division of that army with him. So he could have taken care of these mouthy governors, but he didn't do that. He didn't go after them at all. It kind of reminded me as I was preparing this uh, in Matthew chapter 27 or so when uh, Peter, maybe not 27, I'm trying to remember where, but 24, 5, 6, somewhere around there, when the, they came to rest Jesus at night and Peter got all excited and whacked off the guard uh, ear of one of uh, the attack uh, people who had come to arrest him and, and Jesus said, Peter, cut that out. Don't you know that I could ask my father and he could send legions of angels to fight for me, to defend me, to take care of me. But he didn't do it. I think in this way, Nehemiah is a little bit like uh, a type of the Christ here. Because he had the power to go in and forcefully do this. But he didn't. He knew it was God's will for him to be there and he had a goal to to go, uh, he had a task to do and a goal to reach, just like Jesus said. Peter, if you do this, it makes no sense. If I call the legions of angels, if I ask my father to send these legions of angels, how will scripture be fulfilled? It, it couldn't be. That's not the way we're going to do it. And that's how Nehemiah was acting as well. He could have done this. He could have took care of these loud mouths, but he didn't. What did he do? He comes in and he just starts his project. He starts the thing that God had for him to do. He didn't go in there fighting. He is for the wall being built. He's not against the opposition forces. He came to build, not to fight. He came to build the walls. He came to reestablish Jerusalem and reestablish worship. And that's what he was going to do. Jesus as well came to go to the cross. He didn't come here to fight and reestablish his kingdom on earth. So how about for us? Does this have application for us today? Well, as believers, we want to restore goodness to a, a crazy world. Our society is broken, no matter where you look. Uh, in the prayers today for the Philippines, uh, Pastor Chris prayed, and others prayed, God, let the money go to where it's supposed to go. Let it be rightfully used. Don't let there be abuse of the funds that are going there. You know, get the water where it needs to go, the food where it needs to go, the funds where it needs to go. As kind and loving as we can be and as other nations can be, you know there's going to be some uh, stuff that's going to go in some pockets. It always happens wherever you are. It doesn't matter. And you and I as believers want to restore good things to this world. And the best way we can do that is to introduce people to Jesus Christ. That's what we want to do. Now, as we do this, let me ask you, where will there be opposition to us as we attempt to do this? As we attempt to build the church of Jesus Christ right here where we are, will we be opposed? Well, Pastor Kevin, I try to, you know, get along with people and make them my friends and, and treat them kindly and make them like me and then I tell them about Jesus Christ. Well, that's nice and if it works, it's fine. But God didn't call us to make buddies. He didn't call us to make our neighbors like us. He took, called us to go into all the world and make disciples. And as we do this, I can guarantee you that you will be opposed. If you start telling, Jesus, telling people about Jesus Christ at your workplace, at your universities, at your schools, at your wedding facility, <laughs> if you do this aggressively, you will run into opposition. There will be those who will oppose you. If you start stirring up your neighborhood, you will be opposed. Even here in peaceful Japan, it will happen. It would not be beneficial at all 
for those who represent the status quo here in Hiroshima, in your hometown, in your school, to see the Church of Jesus Christ built the way it should be built. If we start seeing people get saved and radically changed in our schools, in our workplace, it's going to cause a disturbance. People are going to go to church and Bible studies instead of going to the golf course. Instead of staying home, uh, staying away from home every night, working late hours of overtime, they're going to come home and spend time with their families. They're going to start going to Bible studies. And it's going to be a disruption in this, this society. And you will begin to be opposed. Let's move on to Nehemiah, or move back a couple of chapters actually, to Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Let me read that. Now this is when Nehemiah first arrived. He hangs around for three days. He doesn't tell anybody what he's doing. And then he calls the officials together. He calls the gov government leaders of that area together. He has the authority to do this, remember. He's going with a commission from the king of Persia. The king of Persia is ruling that area. Although he's 1,600 kilometers away, he's still ruling that area. And Nehemiah has the paperwork, and he's got the army posted just outside. So when he calls the government officials, they better come. So they came, and Nehemiah told him what he was going to do. And that's where we are in verses 9 and, 9 and 10 in chapter 2. Am I holding this far away from me? It looked funny. Print's getting smaller and smaller. You know, I haven't used this for a while, and when I took it off the bookshelf, you know, I swore this print shrunk some, you know. Okay. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. And cavalry could be up to, you know, a couple of hundred soldiers. It could be a, a hundred or two hundred. Um, you know, we don't know from history enough about what this means to determine the numbers. But it was quite a bit because the governors came. They didn't argue. They just came. And they had their own army as well. When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, or you could just change Tobiah there to Wormwood, the Ammonite uh, official heard about this. They were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Huh. Very interesting. A couple of verses. And we'll read this again. And we just read about them being upset in chapter 4. But we'll read it again over there. Here, they're angry. They're really upset. Nehemiah meets with these governors, explaining to them what he's going to do that he's acting with the permission and blessing and provision of the king. They probably saw all the provision that he had. The weapons, the building tools, the money, the food, and these good-looking soldiers. And they're going, mm, okay, he's got all that. And yeah, the paperwork is valid. He's not coming here on his own. Although later they'll say, yeah, you're not doing this with the permission of the king. And they publicly go, oh, okay, you know, mm, okay, yeah, I guess we have to listen. But still, as we read on, we'll find out that these guys are going to oppose him anyway. Why? They're not afraid of a king that's 1,600 kilometers away. They've got a little army there, but, you know, they can run into the desert before the big army comes if they want, but they're going to oppose him every step of the way. They're pretty bold while the king's over there. Although the Nehemiah does represent the king. Let's just look at a couple of words from these two verses. Come on. Let's see what it's... I, I don't know if I use the same version or not anyway. I went to the governors, uh, gave them the king, also gave me army officers and cavalry. When Sambalat heard about, the, about this, they were very much disturbed. Yeah. The, the original language not through my knowledge of Hebrew, but the original language from commentaries that I've read means they were trembling with, angry, with anger. They were so angry. Have you ever been that angry? Or you just shook? No? That's my wife. I, I've gotten that angry. She knows. She knows. I've gotten that angry. Oh, I can't believe that. 
I didn't raise my sons to behave like that. No, no. I've been that angry. My legs shake. You know, like when you're nervous at a speech or something, right? The adrenaline is just going and you shake. This is how these guys were doing. They were, you know, he's reading this official document, or he probably he wasn't even reading it. He probably got one of his biggest soldiers to read it. That's what I'd have done. Hey, hey, was the biggest guy? Hey, you come and read this. The governors are acquiescing and going, yes, sir, yes, sir. But boy, he could just see their teeth were gritted and their legs were shaking. They were upset. And they're upset. They're trembling with fear here. But it gets, the language changes as we get to chapter 4. Their anger is growing. They're really, really getting upset. And you know why they're upset? Now, look at this. But, I mean, Nehemiah hasn't done a thing. He hasn't put one of those burnt rocks up on the top of another burnt rock. He hasn't even done a thing yet. Just hearing. Just the idea that Jerusalem might get reestablished incenses them so bad that they're shaking. And why? Because they had a system in place that was beneficial to them and not to the Jews, not to the Israelites, not to the temple, not to the worship of God. And they opposed that. Here's this Jew with credentials from the king, and he's going to mess up the status quo. Everything's fine. You know the Japanese have a word, it's called bunan. It's, it's just, it's okay. No. N doesn't bother anybody. It's fine. That's why you see so many white cars in Japan. I asked a friend, I said, why'd you get a white car? This was 20, 30 years ago. Why'd you get a white car? It's not even a color. He said, Buna. Midori, what's Buna mean? Doesn't cause any commotion. Doesn't stir anybody up. <laughs> and so you start causing problems in Jerusalem and they're not going to like it. It's going to make them shake with anger. That's what was happening. Let's go a little further. Why? Because they didn't want the welfare of the Israelites to be promoted. What is the welfare of the Israelites? We know it, uh, in America we think of welfare as you know, distributing food stamps and you know, helping people to go to college and stuff who can't afford it. it. It means a lot. It means the good of the Jews. Just anything good for them. Anything that would make them healthier, better, give them a little better lifestyle, to see them restored. Now they're running around scared. You know, everything scares them. They're oppressed by the, the local governors. Nobody likes the Jews there. But now Nehemiah's coming and he's going to reestablish the wall, and they're thinking, that's going to benefit the Jews. We don't like it. We don't want it. We're upset. Uh, we're not going to let this stand. I don't care about the king. He's way over there. We're here. This is our place. So keeping the Jewish people down was really beneficial to the local government. And it's not changed today, is it? Have you, if you look at a map of Israel 20, 30 years ago, and if you look at a map of Israel today, it's, it looks like this. You know, it's, it's become sort of, you throw a rock across it almost. And the, Israel being benefited is not benefiting those who live around Israel. We have two different responses in this story. The local governors responded to Nehemiah's announcement and his presence with feelings of so much anger. They were trembling. They were so upset. They couldn't even talk. They were so upset. I bet they couldn't eat dinner that night. They were so upset. You know, believe this guy. Who does he think he is? And how did Nehemiah respond to their anger, though? He knew they were angry. He knew they were going to be angry. He just responded by simply moving forward with his plans to rebuild. He, he didn't get upset like they did. We'll see in the story that he just goes, oh, yeah, okay, I mean, that's fine. But we're going to rebuild anyway. I'm just going to go over and start piling up rocks. He just moved forward. We're going to see a pattern develop here with Nehemiah's actions. But first, let's look at what this means for us today as a church. What is our God-given mission right here, right now? Or what is your God-given mission right here, right now? Think about it. What is it? Do you know what it is? 
Do you have something stirring in your heart? Has God planted something inside of you that, that wants you to act, to do something, to see Jesus Christ promoted in your area, in your city, in your prefecture, or even narrow it down in your home? What is your God, your local God-given mission? Then the other question you have to ask is, is there anyone who might oppose me in this? We have to ask that at Mitaki, because it's a pattern throughout Scripture, and that's why we're looking at it in Nehemiah. It happened in the New Testament to the disciples. It happened to Jesus, then the disciples, and, and on and on. The new church, after disciples were gone, it happened. We have Scriptures that tell us, don't fight against those things, but go to God in prayer when these things happen. In the New Testament, it's, it's not just Nehemiah, but if you and I get a burden for God and begin to do something unique and special and life-changing here, right where we are, right in our workplace, right where we live, somebody's going to oppose you. You can count on it. But when it does happen, would that be personal? Remember I told you it didn't have to be Nehemiah that came and did this. Would it be personal? Would it be because you're white or black or uh, a non-Japanese Asian or, or anything else? Would it be because you don't speak the language perfectly? That might have some bearing on it, but it's not going to be everything. Would the opposition just be because you're upsetting the status quo right here? That's probably the answer. So, do you know what you're... God-given mission is? Do you know what it is for Mitaki? Do you know what it is for you personally? What is it? Well, I don't know, Kevin. I've been trying to ask God, what's his will for my life? Okay, well, we'll talk about it. Nehemiah knew, and this is how he knew it. How did he know? Just to, to review the review, 1,600 kilometers away from Jerusalem, modern-day Iran, serving on the king's court, everything was fine. Is everything fine with you? Right? He hears about the desolation of Jerusalem and it turns his emotional and spiritual world upside down. Everything's good. He knows about the religion, the God of his ancestors. He knows about the temple. He knows about the wall that separated Jerusalem from the unbelieving community. He knew about that. Never been there, but he knew. And he was okay with that. Historically, he was fine with it. He knew about it. He loved the idea of it. And then he hear, heard about the desolation of it, and it just turned his world upside down. He couldn't stand it. He goes into prayer and fasting. And during that time period, God refines the mission. He says, are you going to lay here and cry? Or are you going to do something? And are you going to do something radical? And he does something very radical. He presents his plan to the unbelieving king. Now you've got to read this again and see what he does and how he does it. And think about it in a historical perspective. In the presence of the king and his wife, he says, this is what I'm sad about and this is what I want to do. If the king didn't like what somebody said to him in those days, his head was gone in no time, and Nehemiah knew this. He was not worried about that. He did something so radical, he said, I'm going to tell the king, I'm going to tell him everything I need, what I want to do, and then I'll be gone for 12 years. And if he takes my head off, oh well. At least I know that I've obeyed God. Now, what about you? What about me? <laughs> Am I going to... Listen to God. Am I willing to take radical steps? Am I willing to pray and fast for long periods of time to let God refine his God-given mission to me? Well, Nehemiah expected to be opposed and he prepared for it. Maybe the opposition is that we might fear is what's keeping us back from doing what God wants us to do. Are you afraid of what's going to happen to you in your workplace if you really tell somebody about Jesus Christ? If you invite them to a Bible study? If they actually come to your Bible study and get saved, what are you going to do? Well, how did Nehemiah 
behave when he thought about the opposition, did he run away from it? Did he say, hmm, that's a long trip. And how am I going to get there? Ah, let somebody else do it. Maybe there's a YWAM in that day. Maybe they can go. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. He went to prayer and fasting before leaving Persia. And he prayed all the way along the way to Jerusalem. He brought, he prepared by getting paperwork. He didn't just go out there on his own. He made sure he had the paperwork, and that's what we just talked about. He read that. I, I love this part. He did the practical side of it, too. I've met, on two occasions, young people coming to Japan for ministry, carrying their cross, literally carrying a cross, from the tip of Japan all the way down, and neither of them were prepared. They were, neither one were prepared. They thought Japan was a tropical paradise, and they came in short sleeves and didn't even have a coat, and some other issues. But Nehemiah wasn't like that. He had everything he needed. He had food, he had water, he had supplies, he had building materials. He had everything he needed. He was prepared. He knew he was going to be opposed. And so when he arrived, he did the right thing. He went in and did, you know, he probably brought gifts. Like, you know, it's an Asian country, an Oriental country anyway. You bring gifts, you, you do the, the greeting. He said, by the way, we're having a meeting down the street. I'm going to read some paperwork from the king. I expect you to be there. They all came. And this is a really good way that he prepared. He prayed, right? He had the authority, right? He, had, uh, he knew who to meet with. And he brought the king's army. He's not dumb. I'm not going to go out there without the army. Well, God can protect me, but I'm smart too. I'm going to bring the army. These guys want to get upset with me? Okay. I'm not going to fight. I'm going to build. He prepared every aspect before he went. Do you know your own God-giving mission as part of Mitaki or as, as you an in, in individual without Mitaki maybe? Would you be willing to pray and fast until God confirmed the assignment he is giving you? And let him refine that in your life. Would you be willing to fast and pray for t long periods of time? You shouldn't take on big assignments that God gives you lightly. It should be done with much fasting and praying and consulting with God's people. You can't just go in and yell and scream for Jesus. You have to prepare. <laughs> you have to pray and you have to fast. There's a pattern throughout Scripture. It's not enough. And this is something that I'm so guilty about and have been since I've been here. I love sitting around with other believers and talking about the needs we have in Hiroshima. And then going home and eating. And that's it. It stops there. I come to church and say, oh, the need is so great. Can't wait for God to do something here. And I do nothing. I get online and say, pray for Hiroshima. That's it. Is that enough? Been doing it for years. It's not enough. It's good to share those things with others. But we got to do something. Just the fact that we are burdened with it. God is trying to yell at us. Do something. Fast and pray at least. And see if it's me. If there's something stirring your heart. If God has put something in your heart. Take it to God. Do you know what God is likely to do when you do that? When you begin to fast and pray. God, what is it that you want me to do? Hey, God, I see this terrible thing. I see all these people on the train that don't know me. I come to church on Sunday and there's just a handful of Japanese in church. And there's no, you know, there's 50 churches here, but many of them are half empty. We see them going all over the place, but they're not going to church. They're not coming to my Bible study. Where are they? God, do something. And if you take that attitude with God, do you know what God is likely to do? Right? You know what he's likely to do, right? He's going to make you part of the solution. He's not going to ask your pastors to do it. 
Well, I'm going to take them to Adam's Bible study. Start your own Bible study. You can go to Adam's too. But if you ask God to do something about the salvation of the people in Hiroshima, he's going to say, okay, this is what you do. I'll bring them to Mitaki and let them talk to Pastor Chris. That's a good idea too. Not Pastor Kim. <laughs> If God has created his servants in your spirit, don't sit on it. Don't just sit there and do nothing. Don't sit on it. I see some of you moving around like, oh. <laughs> Fast and pray. Fast and pray. Listen to God. Do what he leads you to do. No, wait. For other people. I mean, you might not get anybody to come along with you. If God tells you to do something, do it. Please expect and prepare for opposition. If you get a job somewhere and you go into that company and there's a, some kind of opportunity for you to teach a Bible study or tell your company, and this has happened to me, I've, I've been asked to tell my company about the history of Christianity. <laughs> and a company where, you know, oh, we want to know about the culture in America. And a big part of that culture is the church. And since you're a licensed minister, why don't you tell us? Well, when you do that, please be prepared for opposition. It's going to come. It's going to come. large part of our mission is laid out for us in scripture. I have a wonderful, very, a friend who's very close to me. And occasionally he'll say to me, I wonder what God's plan for my life is. I just, I just want to know what his specific plan is. But you know, a big part, I'd say 90% or more of what God wants us to do is already laid out for us in scripture. So if you're waiting for God to write something in, in, on the sky and say, hey Marshall, go to uh, you know, Hokkaido and do this. It's not going to happen. God doesn't write on the sky. He might tell you in a dream, but not likely. He's given us the book. And 90% of what we are to do for God is in the book. It's in there. Read it. Listen to it. Fast and pray about it. And if you get a burden in your heart, and a burden in your heart, you know, it's good Christianese, but what it means is just something that's not letting you have that peace inside of you. It's not so mystical. It's like every time you lay down, instead of thinking about whether the saints are going to win against whoever they're playing next, you think about, man, yeah, Tohoku. You know, next time I get a three-day weekend, I need to go over there. And you can't let that go. And, and you don't go. And it just, you know, you can't. You can't let it go. That kind of thing. But it is laid out for us in scripture, isn't it? Here, here's, here's one scripture. Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. I'm not going to put it up here, so you'll have to find it with me. But It's the Great Commission, right? We all know this. Let me back up. To verse 18, then Jesus came and told his disciples, uh, came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Now, this is about making disciples. We often make it out about being a, a scripture about witnessing, but you, you can't make disciples of somebody who you've not witnessed to and they haven't gotten saved. So God has called us, this is not just for the disciples. Would you agree with that? This is for us today. We are to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We're already in all parts of the world, aren't we? I mean, this is where we are. And we've got to teach them. Well, this is a big part of it. And we can find other scriptures that say, go out and witness, share Christ, comfort one another, do the work of an evangelist. We have those 
It's in here. You don't have to wait for God to, you know, speak to you in a dream. No. Think about Nehemiah. He didn't have the, all the scriptures that we have today, so he didn't have that advantage. But if we were to do this today, what I just read, if we were to go into the world and effectively, aggressively, actively make disciples right here in Mitaki, in Hiroshima, in Iwakuni, wherever we live, if we were to do this, wherever we are, would we face opposition? Oh, you bet. You bet. It's not going to be easy for you. They're going to tell you, oh, we didn't know you were a pastor. <laughs> we didn't know you were that serious about religion. We thought we wanted you to teach about culture. What are you doing? A Bible study? You teach the Bible? <laughs> yeah, it's going to come. We've been told in, have we been told in Scripture? Should we realize that we, hmm? Did I even make this into English? Have we been told in scripture, should we realize that we will face opposition to quietly confine our activities to church and not start making waves? I don't know what I wrote here. But if you face opposition, does the scripture say, okay, you've got opposition now. It's uncomfortable now. You're in a foreign country. Cut it out. Go back to church and be quiet. Does scripture ever tell us that? Just because we have opposition to quietly go away and just make religion a personal thing. All right, well, what do we always get told at parties? We never talk about religion and politics, right? But they're always quick to talk about politics, right? But if you talk about religion, that's it. You're done for. You're a radical. You're a nut. You're never getting invited back again. Opposition! But scripture doesn't tell us to run back to church and just sit here and do nothing. How many of us come to church and that's it? Because we don't want to be opposed. Who likes to be opposed? We want to be accepted and liked. Right? Jesus said, go into all the world and make friends. Be nice to people. Well, that's not what's written in there. Sorry. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter... I know I'm, I'm long, sorry. Happens when I don't get to preach often. Let's turn to chapter 2, verse 9 through 19 through 3, 1. I take that back. I'm not sorry. That's right. All right. Oh, I, what I wanted to read later, uh, 2, 19 through 3, 1. Yeah, let's just start there. But when Sambalat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, or Wormwood, and Geshem, the Arab, Arab, <laughs> so I'm from the south, we say Arab, Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? Verse 20. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. Now, we, we don't know about his tone here, but it doesn't say he yelled at them or anything, you know. He didn't, he didn't say anything like that. We are his servants. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. And look at this. Chapter 3, verse 1. Eliashib the high priest, Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. There were many, many gates. They went to work and built the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. Hananel. Okay. Very interesting passage of scripture, especially I like chapter 3, verse 1. When the opposition heard about Nehemiah's plan, what else could they do? I mean, you know, they've tried everything else. They've gotten angry, and now, you know, okay, let's mock them. Maybe they'll stop if we mock them. If, if we tease them, they'll stop. Ta what are you guys going to do? What are you doing here? Oh, paperwork's fake. Anybody can, you know, we can go to a 100 yen shop and get paperwork like that. They ridiculed him, him, him and his crew. How did Nehemiah respond? He didn't retaliate. He just gave him a simple little hand. 
okay, but you know, you can say what you want to say. You can do what you want to do. We're just going to get busy rebuilding the wall. This is what we're going to do. We're just going to start. He didn't call him out. He just said, okay, I'm going to start. Why did he start with? He started with the sheep gate. What comes through the sheep gate? Sheep. Why did he do that? Why did he start there? There's a fish gate and there's a dung gate. But it's sheep gate. Why did he start there? Very interesting. What did they do with sheep in those days? In the Jewish system of religion, what did they do with sheep? They sacrificed them for the worship of God. Nehemiah was so smart and so busy following God that he knew the important thing was to reestablish worship first. The problem with Jerusalem was not the enemy outside, but is that the worship of God had died. They weren't worshiping God, so he started with the priests. And he said, you know how to do this. You know how to worship God. This is the first thing we've got to do. We've got to set the sheep gate up first so we can worship God properly. The spiritual problem must be attacked first. Got to solve that first. He reestablishes worship first. Very first thing he does. Is that a lesson for us? We can come up with all kinds of plans to get things going, but we must put worship of God first. And whatever we do, wherever God sends us on a mission, we must put the spiritual problem at the top. Still with me? Kind of long. I'm sorry. I'm not. <laughs> Those in the op opposite. Let's look at verse. Let's go to chapter 4 real quick. When Sambalat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, finally they're getting to it now, he became angry and was greatly incensed. Now the language is changing here. You know, he was upset before, now he's great, greatly incensed. Very angry. Crazy with anger. He ridiculed them again. It didn't work the first time, he tried it again. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Why is he asking about sacrifices? Because the sheep gate's already up and going. He knows. And he's worried. He better be worried. <laughs> Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And then, you know, as we read earlier, Tobiah, Tobiah the Ammonite who was at his side said, what they are building, it is, if even a fox climbed upon it, he would break down their wall of stones. Well, why are you so worried about it then? If a fox could do it, just go get a couple of foxes and have them run out there. Verse 4. Nehemiah's response. Does he respond by challenging Sambalat Sambala to a fight? I would have. <laughs> Come on, get over here. Toe to toe. Come on, I'm tired of you. It's been four chapters and you're still giving me all this trouble. He doesn't. Look at what he does. He prays. What an amazing prayer he prays. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Whoa! What a prayer. What a godly prayer. Hey, that's not godly. It's pretty violent, Kevin. Nehemiah didn't curse his enemies. He just asked God to do it. I love it. It's an okay prayer. God saved them. And if they won't get saved, oh well. He prayed for God to curse them. Is he a man of God? But he didn't curse them. He didn't fight with them. He didn't argue with them. He just said, God, you hear these guys. And after he prayed, what did he do? What did he do? 
Look at verse 6. It's so cool. But when's, verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall. That's it. Just those first few words. So we rebuilt the wall. He just went back to work. You can oppose us if you want. Go ahead. Oppose us. God, you hear them? I'm not going to say anything bad about them. God, you know what to do. Okay, I'm getting busy. And he started rebuilding the wall. That's it. That's it. It's none of his business to oppose, to fight with those guys. It's not his business. The opposition continued, even though the people were encouraged by the progress. They were getting excited. They would go, yeah, let's do it. The priests are doing it. We're going to have sacrifice again. Yeah, we're going to go to church. We're going to have some music. We're going to have some bird flesh. You know, God's going to be honored again. And these guys keep trying. Verse 7 through 9. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Again, the increase in the, the anger here. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against it. Again, verse 9. But we prayed. But we prayed. That's it. And we posted a guard. Just in case. What was his immediate response? To pray. And to post the guard. Very practical man. Gotta love Nehemiah. Doing what God tells him to do. But he's not foolish either. Listen. When God gives us something to do, just as these people in the book of Nehemiah comes along, people who oppose us, they really want to destroy us. Not because of who we are. Remember, it's not personal. But who we represent. We represent the will of God and what He wants to do in people's lives. And we will be opposed. And if we had another couple hours, I would talk about the spiritual opposition. But maybe that's next week. <laughs> Those who oppose us want to destroy us and stop our progress. They tried. They were so angry. The anger has increased threefold here since the first time we read it. Because people are being encouraged. They don't want people to be encouraged. So they've got to stop it at the source. And the source is Nehemiah and his builders. They want to stop our progress. And last of all, when you and I understand our mission from God. Come on. We must, too small? Sorry. We must fast and pray. Must fast and pray. You can just pray if you want. We must know, we must put it in our hearts and in our minds that we will be opposed. And we have to be prepared for that opposition. Don't let it take you by surprise. Well, I tried my best, but they still kept opposing me. Yes, they will. Yes, it's going to happen. Be ready. When they talk against you, when they yell against you, don't yell back. Go yell at God. Talk to God. Talk to God. Okay, okay. Right. Thank you. I'll be back. I'm going to go talk to my boss. When they continue to oppose us, we simply continue to build what God has told us to build. That's it. That's it. It's not complicated. We follow God no matter what happens. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the life of Nehemiah and how he went to you humbly with a broken heart he came to you for long periods of time he prayed and fasted and then he went about what you had for him to do you stirred something in his soul you refined it in his heart as he prayed and fasted and then he went and rebuilt the wall, just as you told him to do. He didn't fight, 
with the people there. He didn't go to fight, he went there to build. And as you've told us, even in the New Testament, to not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, to present our press requests to you, you will give us your peace. You will guard our hearts. Father, we ask that you would refine your mission to this church here at Mitaki, to the body here, and then to us individually. What is our God-given mission? And then prepare our hearts for the opposition and to be ready for that and to move forward with our project. We ask that you would do that for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.